I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you are watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining us. Today, we are celebrating Citizen Science Month and Benjamin Franklin, who many people consider to be America's first citizen scientist. Franklin believed that all people should engage with science and that that knowledge could be used to advance science for the benefit of all. During this program, we'll enjoy reports from PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Labs, hear from top experts, gain insights from an author of the Field Guide to Citizen Science and more. Most importantly, we'll learn the collective impact we each can have when we get outside and get involved. This spring, Ken Burns' two-part four-hour documentary, Benjamin Franklin, premiered on PBS stations across the nation. The film explores a revolutionary life of one of the 18th century's most consequential and compelling personalities, whose work and words continue to influence us today. Before we begin today's program, we would like to thank our collaborating partners, PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Labs, WIDA and SciStarter, as well as our trusted library partners, more than 1,800 strong, and numerous PBS stations across the country for sharing this important conversation with all of you. But most importantly, we'd like to thank you for joining us. Now, don't forget, following the conversation, there will be an opportunity for questions from the audience. So don't forget to put your question in the chat function. Now let's begin and hear what Student Reporting Lab's youth reporters found out in the field. I don't know a lot about Benjamin Franklin, but I know he's a founding father. And my sister calls me Benjamin Franklin because when I cut my hair, I look like Benjamin Franklin. All I know about Benjamin Franklin is that like, I know he did had something to do with electricity and I actually just found out that he wasn't a president, even though I always thought he was. Benjamin Franklin was a founding father. Um, he did a lot for the country. He invented a lot of stuff. He's also on the $100 bill. He's on the $100 bill, which is my favorite bill. He's also on cash. He's on money. I know that. Benjamin Franklin was at well, that one science guy that we always hear about, but we don't really know what he did. I know he invented the lightning rod because there's that story with the kite and the key, which isn't actually true, but it's a pretty cool story to learn. He invented bifocals, which were useful. Like There are a lot of places in Philadelphia named Benjamin Franklin or something to do with Franklin. Yeah, because I'll be seeing Benjamin Franklin Boulevard and all. Like, who is this guy, bro? He made very significant contributions to society, including many inventions and his journalism work. I know that he's the guy with the kite. I know that he was kind of weird. He took air baths. Um, he lived away from his wife and kids by himself, which I think is a little bit strange. It's important to know history, but I think we don't learn the correct history sometimes. But um, Benjamin Franklin, I think, I didn't even know he invented stuff, so I think it's pretty important to tell that to people, I guess. I do think it's important to know who Benjamin Franklin is because he's a founding father. Like, he was a big part in making this country what it is today. So I feel like if you learn about him, you'll just be able to appreciate the history more. The American identity begins when Benjamin Franklin knit the American colonies together. Franklin is endlessly interesting. Printer, scientist, revolutionary. He is the only founding father who evidently had a sense of humor. His vision is broader than the American Revolution. The things that he spoke of, that he wrote about, had a certain amount of power. He really was an American genius. from Cannon Beach. I'm here with some citizen scientists from Coast and we're out here looking for some dead birds. 
as volunteers, you guys are going to help us collect some data tonight. We're going to do some citizen science and uh, record whatever species of frogs that we hear. One of the unique features of the Great Backyard Bird Count is that it is a citizen science project. What it means for me is all of us being aware of what's happening around us. And to me, science means creating a solution. Citizen science is where we, as the science community, enlist the eyes and the ears of those who live in our communities. So uh, let's go. The Greenville Zoo began a Frog Watch chapter about, uh, it's been eight years ago. So this is our eighth season of monitoring. And we found out about Frog Watch USA because it is run by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. We go out at night, a half an hour after sunset, and we monitor for the, the breeding calls of frogs and toads. And we involve volunteers to help scientists understand about the populations of the frogs at that park. Matthew Smith of the Bird Conservatory of the Rockies is training citizen scientists on how to monitor and report data on bald eagle nests at Bar Lake State Park just east of Denver. We're a nonprofit organization focused on bird conservation working throughout uh, the Great Plains and Intermountain West. Bald eagles are a great conservation success story and we want to keep it that way. You know, getting people involved, you know, helps to educate folks, but it also a really good thing for us uh, because we get the data. We can share it with partners. Um, we work with the state uh, fish and wildlife agencies to uh, analyze the data and, and learn more about the bald eagle population in Colorado. LEO Network, which stands for Local Environmental Observer, is open to anyone who wants to participate. And you set up a, a profile and you can use your phone or your camera or your computer. You can post an observation and then it goes into the system and can be shared with other members so we can see both what's happening at the community, but in broader uh, areas as well. I'm standing here in Jackaloff Creek, close to Seldovia. Uh, in this creek, every year, my family and I come up here and we fish for pink salmon. We've got a cabin pretty close to here. And if you look around me, there's not a lot of pink salmon this year that are going to be good to catch. The Finger Lakes Land Trust has a phenology trail at the Roy H. Park Preserve in Dryden, New York, a place where people can go on a hike and record their observations of six different trees that are part of a national database. It's just this blossoming of this living planet that's so exciting. Julia Parrish is the founder of the Coastal Observation and Seabird Survey Team, also known as COAST, and she travels all over training citizens to collect data for her organization. Citizen science is that perfect blend of the social and the data-driven. It makes me realize that science, science is a social thing. It's not something that you do all by yourself. It's something that you do with a team of people, and I just have a really, really large team. You never really know what you're going to experience and what you're going to discover as you collect your data. You know, we're trying, like endeavors that we can do on a local basis and a global basis. It's changing. It's definitely getting out there as far as the message. In the long run, if everyone really takes those little steps, it would really become a massive movement. And that's going to have ramifications to our way of life. Greetings. Welcome to today's panelist discussion on Franklin, citizen science, and STEM storytelling. I'm Carla Easter, the Assistant Director for Education, Outreach, and Visitor Experience at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Today, I'll be joined by three awesome panelists. Our first panelist will be Dr. Daryl N. Williams, Senior Vice President of Science and Education at the Franklin Institute. Our second panelist will be Michael Medea, Head of Education Programs at the American Philosophical Society, and who was also involved in the creation of the Dr. Franklin Citizen Scientist exhibit. And finally, Sonia Aronson, Climate Resilience Researcher at ICF. During today's discussion, we'll be looking at Ben Franklin's connection to citizen science, STEM, storytelling. 
I'd like to kick things off by first providing a little bit of a context. Although we'll be talking about citizen science, I also want to make note of that there is an ongoing conversation about the differences between citizen science and community science. Although some may use those terms interchangeably, I'd like to point out that some feel that community science is distinct from that of citizen science and that it is oftentimes linked directly to communities and social action for those communities who face environmental injustices and public health challenges and many other challenges. So to get us started, I'd like to ask our first question of Dr. Williams. Hi, Dr. Williams, how are you today? Well, how are you? Great, so my first question for you is Franklin contributed much to science and scientific study that are still relevant. What can we learn from his contributions today? That's a great question. Um, so Franklin was really just insatiably curious. And I think that really sort of undergirds probably his story as it relates to both science and invention. And in terms of contribution, he was really inspired by this idea of knowledge building and really um, was a proponent of not just building knowledge, but also sharing knowledge. And I think in, in some ways that was due to the fact that he was a printer um, and had experience in, in, in that regard. And so he really perpetuated this idea of not only investigation and inquiry, but then also once he was able to collect the data, um, he was able to write about the data and share the data. And so I would even say to some extent, he was probably one of the earlier pioneers with respect to science communication as well. So um, I, I would say if I were to really sort of sum up my answer, it's related to not only just this insatiable curiosity, but this and, and this observing natural phenomena and the world around him, but devising ways through his experience as a tinkerer and as a maker, since we use that term a lot these, these days, and combining all these different facets in a way that made him a really um, influential knowledge science scientific knowledge builder. And then also that fueled his, his passion for invention. He really was inspired by making things that had utility and that were useful. Um, he was not into the idea of patents. He really um, shied away from that because he believed that knowledge should be accessible to everybody. And so, again, um, in combination with that and his, his, his collection of data and the sharing of data really made him um, sort of uh, influence that, I think, and, and has uh, continued to today in terms of how we think about science as a practice um, and how we capture data, how we collect data, and then therefore share and disseminate data and research through publications and things of that nature, which is really sort of what undergirds uh, science as, an, as, a, as a practice, but also um, in the academy as well. So that's a very long-winded way of, of explaining, I think, philosophically how uh, Franklin embodied uh, science and, and, and the process and practice of science and really wanted to influence it, um, you know, beyond it just being an individual um, a pursuit of passion, but really trying to inspire everybody to, to be, sci think scientifically and to practice science. No, I think that's wonderful. I love that you called him sort of the, the quintessential science communicator, because I, I agree, you know, he kind of did that before that was kind of in vogue, so to speak, which is, I think, the perfect segue to the question I have for you, Michael, which is how did Franklin embody the values of citizen science? Uh, and again, thinking about this idea of communication you know, being able to get that information out there, but in terms of his contributions to citizen science. Yeah, it's such a fun question, especially after the one that Dr. Williams answered. Uh, so there are a lot of values in citizen science that Franklin really does embody. I'm going to narrow it down somehow to a magical list of six of them. <laughs> six of them. Um, bringing scientists into conversation with the curious, open participation, 
bridging gaps in access, collaboration, real world conclusions for real world problems, and creating an informed citizenry. Um, so if you take each one, you think about Franklin, uh, before he was a scientist, he, like Dr. Williams mentioned, was motivated and curious. He followed his curiosity uh, about things he just enjoyed, like swimming and making swimming paddles and pins, uh, to things he was motivated to understand, like electricity, uh, all by solving problems and seeking responses from scientists or experts. Um, even in his own experiments, he becomes curious and motivated in so many different ways. In terms of open participation, Franklin would regularly send out correspondences, um, like Dr. Williams, like you mentioned, uh, it's about him corresponding and writing and publishing and reaching out to people uh, through the written word. So he utilized his network really often, and he didn't necessarily put boundaries on uh, who could participate in or benefit from his experiments. Like Dr. Williams mentioned, he didn't really patent any of his inventions. Uh, but it is also important to note that Franklin operated largely within the pre-existing boundaries of his time, right? So free or enslaved black people, immigrants, certain classes were all generally excluded from participating in uh, Franklin's work in some ways. But uh, women, on the other hand, mostly flowed between inclusion and exclusion for, for Franklin. Um, this kind of leads into bridging gaps in access for Franklin. And uh, writing seems to be the theme of the day. So for Franklin's writing and publishing, uh, he often wrote and published in ways that were accessible to the everyday person. He's the everyday founder too, right? Um, but if you think about his uh, major publication, Experiments and Observations, the first one that launched him into scientific stardom, it got him there because it was written in friendly, accessible ways where the everyday person could do those experiments and really latch onto them. Uh, collaboration uh, for Franklin is an everyday thing from mapping the Gulf Stream uh, to his practices in printing currency, Franklin and scientists even today rarely do anything in isolation. Um, so he always had a collaborator with him, um, either his cousin, Timothy Folger, his own children, his sister, uh, tradesmen and their families. Franklin relied on those extensive networks in so many different ways, shapes and forms. Uh, you even think about organizations Franklin founded and they require other people. So collaborations at the core of what Franklin does. Uh, the, the this fifth one of real world conclusions is one of my favorites. The uh, mission of the APS is promoting useful knowledge and Franklin and the other founders of the society knew that knowledge has to have uh, practical and useful solutions and applications. Uh, so you take his uh, pathway on electrical experiments um, where he, as soon as he understood how it worked or gained that knowledge, he started applying that to practical things like the lightning rod, um, seeing if it could cure rheumatism. Granted, there, there were some goofy things along the way. He killed a turkey to see if it could uh, actually be killed by, electri uh, by electricity. So these kind of lighthearted things, but still practical in some sense. And of course, the, the last one, which might be the most important, um, the idea of creating an informed citizenry through or community, right? We think about the words uh, that we're using to describe this practice. Uh, Franklin has that great quote, uh, Republic, if you can keep it. Uh, being scientifically informed is part of keeping that Republic alive and well. Um, and he was well aware of the ideas of scientific problems being integrated into society, policy being formed by scientific problems. And you think about today with medical rights and access, climate change, all of these scientific problems are really being wrapped up in policy. So um, I think it's a very Franklin thing to be informed about science so you can be informed about what it means to be a citizen, be part of the community, be involved in your area and surroundings. Um, so that's the briefest possible way I can sum up those answers. <laughs> Uh, that that's fantastic. As I as you were speaking, I was thinking to myself, he is kind of that bridge between citizen science and community science. If you yeah. think about it, he sits right in the middle there because of, as you said, this desire to have an informed citizenry, but also again the republic connecting to science, which is incredibly important, especially when we think about today and people's need to have access to that information, but also be able to apply it and use it. So I, I think that's wonderful. I think you you pared it down perfectly. <laughs> wonderful way to describe it. And that leads me next to my question for Sonia. And this one really is something that's near and dear to me. And it's about the importance of storytelling in engaging communities and especially younger generations around science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or STEM. And so what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think that stories really have the power to help people understand each other and how people interact with the world. And for young people, that's really important because 
um, we're as when we're younger, we're more receptive to certain things. And like like Benjamin Franklin, I think young people are just generally very curious about the world. I know that was definitely true for myself. And I found that storytelling really helps people engage with something and it can help them understand it better. And so for me, I felt that learning something story, especially a subject like STEM, um, helped me understand it better. And as a result, I was able to explain it better to others. And I grew up with a very strong sense of urgency. Um, I learned about climate change at a very young age, and I was worried about endangered species and about overpopulation. Um, and that is, and I always wanted to express that, but I didn't know how. And so developing those tools to communicate um, is really important. And storytelling is a huge part of that. As young people, it cannot be overstated that the changes that the changes that world leaders make in the next few years are going to determine our futures and our children's futures. And that we are the ones who are going to carry the burden of a world that didn't ask, that didn't act fast enough. So if we can pay attention to the changes that are taking place in the world and tell the stories of those who are disproportionately impacted, like things like climate change, that is going to be really essential. Um, and I found that to be true for myself. I thought I wanted to be a journalist, but like I said, I really wanted to explain science to others. And so when I was in high school, I was part of an after school media program that partnered with the PBS News Hour. And we, my teacher and I chose to do a story on a ballot measure that would fund wetlands restoration in the San Francisco Bay. And to do that story, we interviewed scientists in the field who explained the importance of wetlands as carbon sinks and as natural buffers from flooding and as habitat for hundreds of species. And I realized that for me to feel like I could write a compelling story, especially a story about something this scientifically complicated, um, it was essential for me to understand the fundamentals of how that works. And so when I got to college, I actually chose to study science. Um, and I want to make it clear that you can study science every day. All you have to do is walk outside or you can observe people in your own life. And that's part of being a citizen science. But I really wanted to understand the chemistry and biology and physics that underpin our world right now. But I have always tried to maintain this lens that we need to be telling the stories we need to be telling our stories as young people. We need to be telling the stories of those who are disproportionately impacted by climate change. Um, and we need to be telling success stories because there's a lot going on out there that is really, really amazing. And it's helping our world become more resilient to things like hurricanes and wildfires and floods that are increasing and will continue to increase. Um, but if we can create this community through storytelling, and especially as young people, if we can rally to create that community, I think that's going to be very, very valuable. Wow, that's, that's fantastic. So in our last few minutes, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to riff off of what Sonia said so beautifully about storytelling and the importance of it. And if you all could give me just maybe a minute, respond to the question, what can Franklin teach us about science, technology, engineering, and mathematics being for everyone? I give you all a second to think and, <laughs> and then maybe I'll go in the order yeah. we started with. I'll, well, I'll just sort of jump in because I think this is great. And I, I think both, uh, the other panelists had excellent points. Um, I think it really, it centers, you know, sci we, we're born curious, we're born asking questions. So this is sort of part of being human is being curious. And so the science part and really understanding sort of the process of science develops over time as we scaffold in our learning. And I think the other part too that is really um, 
beautiful about Franklin and his legacy is this idea or this notion of lifelong learning and how science can perpetuate that process. And so I think thinking about it from that perspective, it's really about how science enables us to be able to um, maintain a level of curiosity with the idea of also being able to not only ask questions, but finding practical ways of answering those questions. And we're all the better for it when we're all invested in this notion of collective problem solving. Um, so I think Franklin is such a fun historical figure to talk about because he can be applied to so many different situations. And today we're talking about STEM. Uh, but I think Franklin is the example of what it means when everybody has access to something. Um, so for Franklin, this is much about um, access being included for everybody and access not being included for everybody on both sides, right? Uh, there's a quote from his sister in one of the final letters that she sent him um, before he passed away. And I'm paraphrasing and butchering, but it's essentially, uh, imagine how many more Franklins and other famous scientists there could be if we removed boundaries so that others could have the same types of advantages and successes that you did uh, for her referring to Franklin. Um, so I think that whole uh, snippet at the end of his life is the great kind of thing of if access is for everybody, then there can be more Franklins in the world, which I think that would be a great thing to happen. Wonderful, thank you. And so Sonia, you get the last word. I think that was very well said. Um, I certainly, grew up being inspired by Franklin and his abilities to just learn from the world around him. And I think we can all, we can all do that. And there's nothing stopping us from just going outside and watching things and being observant. Um, and I really, I really think that Franklin had a huge impact on, I mean, I'm glad he had a huge impact, but I think if there are more Franklins that the more Franklins, the better. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to thank you all so much for spending the time um, this this day uh, talking about the various um, contributions of Benjamin Franklin and for being part of today's discussion. So again, thank you all so much. So up next, we're going to hear from Leah Clapman, the founder of PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Labs, about the lifelong impact for students at the intersection of STEM and storytelling and the resources to get started. Thank you. Thanks so much for the opportunity to add student journalism and storytelling to this amazing event. For almost a decade, PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Labs has worked with teens, media teachers, and local public media stations to facilitate STEM storytelling, including citizen science and engineering. Our curriculum and mentoring model empowers classrooms, clubs, programs, and individuals to tell the stories of the inventive spirit that lives in all of us, especially young people. We publish student videos on the PBS NewsHour, which reaches millions of viewers, and on local station broadcasting and digital platforms. And that motivation and opportunity truly sets us apart. We want all middle and high school students to find their voice and build confidence through storytelling and media production, especially those who are underrepresented in the STEM fields and in media coverage generally. The best way to join us in this mission is to check out our new storytelling platform, Storymaker. Let's take a look. Everything starts with a story, and it's never been more important for students to use their voices and tell theirs. Welcome to Storymaker a dynamic resource platform designed for educators to help your students become confident, powerful storytellers. With Storymaker, you can create unique educational experiences that are relevant and rewarding. Our NSF funding is exploring how to support all teachers to facilitate STEM learning through science reporting, but also through research and by cultivating curiosity, the key to good journalism. We believe the research findings will help other programs scale build successful educator communities, and expand the number of students learning STEM skills through storytelling. Anyone can access Storymaker for free. Simply navigate to resources on the homepage. The resources library is where you can start exploring lessons, projects, media making challenges, and tutorials. 
There are also STEM lessons for fact-checking and using evidence. Always dig a little deeper on your own. Storytelling and reporting about an issue you care about opens a window that wasn't there before. It gives us the opportunity to make a positive difference, raise awareness, and change the world, one story at a time. PBS Books is thrilled to be here today with Darlene Cavalier, author of The Field Guide to Citizen Science, How You Can Contribute to scientific research and make a difference. Darlene Cavalier is the founder of SciStarter, a popular citizen science portal and research platform connecting millions of people to real science they can do. She's also the founder of Science Cheerleaders, a nonprofit comprised of current and former NFL, NBA, and college cheerleaders pursuing STEM careers. Co-founder of ECAST, expert in citizen assessment of science and technology and co-founder of sciencenearme.org. She is also a professor of practice at Arizona State University School for the Future of Innovation in Society. In addition, she is a founding board member of the Citizen Science Association, an advisor and fellow at National Geographic, appointed to the National Academy of Sciences, designing citizen science to support science learning committee and named co-chair of America 250th Innovation, Science and Entrepreneurism Advisory Council. She is the co-editor of The Rightful Place of Science, Citizen Science and author of Science of Cheerleading. Believe it or not, she does all of that, and she resides in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, with her husband and four kids. It is my pleasure to welcome Darlene. Hello. Hi, Heather. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so sorry for that long bio. <laughs> no, you are amazing. You've done so many things, and we're so pleased that you're here today. Before we begin, I'd love to for you to share a little bit about SciStarter. It says this book, your book, Why We're Here, was written by the experts of SciStarter. What is SciStarter? SciStarter is a website, but it's more than a website. It's basically become a community where scientists who need help from the public, sometimes scientists don't have enough data or they have too much data. This is where the public can come in, and we'll talk about that in a bit, are connected with members of the public. So anybody who's curious or concerned about something, you're going to find a way to take action on that at SciStarter. So we're a connector between people looking for volunteers and volunteers looking for a way to make a difference. So we've heard about citizen science already today, but I was hoping that you could share a little bit about what inspired you to write this book now. Well, my colleagues and I, the co-authors, um, really th felt it was time to do more than SciStarter, the website. And part of that was just to show people how truly easy it is to find and engage in citizen science. And then we were very lucky that Timber Press Publishing approached us and asked us to write the book. <laughs> so really that determined the timing of the book. But it became very um, fortuitous, I guess, because our book was published right before the pandemic. And what we saw during the pandemic was about a 480 percent increase in the number of people coming to SciStarter. That wasn't because of the book. The book was helpful for sure. It happened to be that people were trapped inside. We all know the story, looking for things to do. Citizen science became a way for people to stay connected, feel like they were learning things, making a difference. Um, and actually there were quite a few COVID related projects that needed help from the public as well. Um, the really interesting thing is that we haven't seen that number go below pre-pandemic. Um, numbers in terms of the number of people coming to SciStarter. So millions of people come to SciStarter. There's thousands of opportunities, including projects and events. And in fact, we're right in the middle of Citizen Science Month. So there's lots and lots of events happening this month in April. Um, and then there are, well, there's close to 130,000 registered users of SciStarter. who are very actively engaged in all of these ways of helping to advance scientific research. I just want to stay on that point for one second. Scientists or project leaders sometimes don't have enough data. I mentioned that earlier. So that might be 
because they can't get out to the places they need to go. So imagine during the pandemic, they're really limited in being able to get out and collect data. Their graduate students couldn't get out there and collect data. So they really relied on people to make and share observations from where they are. And in fact, you know, I can look at my window and probably do 15 citizen science projects easily, probably more. So that might be, I follow a protocol. These are instructions. These are common sets of instructions that everybody follows. This is how the data becomes reliable for scientists to be able to use to advance important research. You might be asked to um, observe local weather day after day, or maybe count pollinators once, just for a couple of minutes. Every single action is important. Even if you don't see what a scientist is looking for, a report of zero is an important action, believe it or not. Or scientists have too much data. And this might be because they are sifting through images from the Hubble telescope or sifting through medical images of um, cells that may be showing um, signs of cancer. Believe it or not, regular people with zero um, formal training in science or any kind of past experiences in the sciences are getting involved in analyzing, annotating these online records and truly accelerating medical research in the process and other forms of research too. You know, it's really incredible how you put it and how we learn through this book that you can truly make a difference. You don't have to be a scientist, but you can you can pursue whatever love you want, but still make a difference in the scientific community. So we're all here today celebrating our connection of citizen science with Ben Franklin. Can you take a moment before we jump more into your book and, and different aspects of your book, how is your book related to Ben Franklin's version of citizen science and who he was and his legacy? I mean, he's the ultimate citizen scientist. Now, he happened to live at a time before science was a word. <laughs> and citizen science certainly was not terminology that was known back then. But many of his discoveries, many of what he's known for, never could have happened without the help of his fellow citizens. And these are citizens of the world in this case. Um, to better understand the Gulf Stream, he enlisted the help of his cousin and other sailors to learn more and help really dig into uh, learning about the distance between the planets. He needed help from people pretty much all over the world. There's so many different instances where Ben Franklin recognized the power of the crowds and how no one person knows everything, but everybody knows something. And so this is how collectively he was able to advance really important discoveries, many of which he's known for today. So that's a direct link, honestly, between Ben Franklin and citizen science. So one of the things I love about your book is that you make it so easy for the ordinary person like me to be able to participate in these experiments. So just to let the audience know, if, in case you haven't yet read citizen science, um, there is a section that is really focused on the individual, how you can engage online, you can uh, do it at home, nature, and then it's more community focused in terms of with libraries, with educators in schools, and with community centers. Can you talk a little bit about that? That's right. So uh, a lot of citizen science is on this individual level. Individual in terms of how you get involved. You're always working with a lot of other people, but you can, you know, you may never know who they are. The community-based um, type of approach, libraries actually are an extremely important facilitator and partner with this, with SciStarter and with Arizona State University. And thanks to support from you know, the National Library of Medicine and the Institutes for the Museum of Library Services and others, we've been able to really work closely with libraries all across the country to co-create kits that have everything somebody needs in order to get involved in a project. This is basically because we found two things. One, um, people feel more confident and comfortable getting involved in projects when they're doing it with others. They can learn more. They actually learn way more than what was involved in that project, and they can take it a lot further. It's one thing to start to monitor um, changes in the climate around you, um, light pollution, just by stargazing and starting to understand how light pollution, that's ambient light, is affecting not just your ability to see stars, but maybe your sleeping habits, maybe the nesting patterns of birds around you. That is a citizen science component. But when you're involved with a community, you can actually take that to the next level and do something about it. So that's an interesting part of how 
citizen science starts to develop into something called community science. So libraries help provide the tools, literally the tools, the physical instruments. Most projects don't require anything, you know, other than a computer to be able to share your results back um, because you can make an observation, but until you share it, it's not citizen science. What a library does is help people understand how to use a sensor if a sensor is required. There's no reason a person should have to invest in a sensor when they're volunteering for a project, but also be able to localize the experience local field guides to what, what kind of birds and plants you might um, uh, be more likely to see, for example. Um, related um, meetings and community groups that are talking about the issue that you're involved in. So there's six different kits, any librarian that's interested, you can make these kits. We put the recipe up on scistarter.org forward slash library. You can join a network of librarians who are helping to create new kits, finding really interesting programs to continue to support the citizen scientists that are in their area. They're able to identify subject matter experts to come in. Those libraries become incredibly important conduits to people that are often difficult to reach. In Arizona, these might be people who use the library because that's where their air conditioning is. That's where their source of a, a Wi-Fi or internet is. That's where the source of a computer is getting those disenfranchised communities involved in actually doing learning science, contributing, um, has had really neat uh, effects that make us all feel like we're doing something worthy. Well, thank you so much, Darlene. This book is fantastic, and I really recommend that everyone grab one, um, whether you're able to do it as an educator and share it with a group of people or work on your own. I think you'll get excited. Just by looking at this book, you real will realize our opportunities to make a difference day in and day out and to contribute so much to the environment we live in. So great way to celebrate Citizen Science Month is to get involved today and to get the book from your local library, if not from somewhere else. <laughs> have, a, have a great day and we look forward to seeing you again, darling. Thank you so much, Heather. I appreciate this opportunity. Hello, everyone, and to all of my community citizen scientists out there. My name is Portia Ray, and I am the Earth Echo Water Challenge Program Manager. Today, I have our guest speaker, Caroline, joining us. She is our Water Challenge Ambassador, and I'm so excited for you all to hear her story on how she became a citizen scientist. But before I dive into our guest speaker, I want to take a moment to talk about who Earth Echo International is and what do we do? So for those who've never heard of us, Earth Echo International envisions a world where every individual from all backgrounds, all experiences has the opportunity and the tools to create a healthy and thriving environment. To that end, our mission is to build a global youth movement to protect and restore our ocean planet. Our organization was founded in 2005 by Philippe and Alexandria Cousteau in honor of their father, Philippe Cousteau Sr., who is the son of the legendary ocean explorer, Jacques Cousteau. As an organization, we collaborate with youth around the world by providing the knowledge and the tools that drive meaningful environmental action and citizen science projects that protect and restore our ocean planet. The program that we're going to highlight today is the Earth Echo Water Challenge program. So for those out there who are really interested in becoming community scientists and getting involved in collecting data, this is the program that will help get you connected to your bodies of water. The Earth Echo Water Challenge program is designed to equip participants with the tools needed to tackle the water crisis surrounding their communities. The program starts with three simple steps. Participants are encouraged to go out to test their local water quality, share their information on the Earth Echo Water Challenge database, which is monitorwater.org, and use that data to influence and to inform action to protect their local water resources. So that's that citizen science piece. 
So speaking of citizen science, going to monitorwater.org, you will have access to our global database where you as a young person, as a participant can share your water quality data with us and with other young people around the world. Simply create an account and click on add your results. Next, and our final step, which is very important, is the protection piece. Tell us your story. Tell us what you have done as a citizen scientist to protect your water resources and how to engage with your community. So what I am going to do now is introduce our next guest speaker, Caroline. Well, thank you so much, Portia. Uh, I am Carolyn Crowley. I am a Youth uh, Water Challenge Ambassador from just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Right now, I am in Los Angeles touring colleges, but of course, I brought my Citizen Science Earth Echo Water Challenge kit with me because Citizen Science takes no vacations. Um, my particular thing is water. I really love the water science aspect of Earth Echo, and that's really why I got involved with the organization. I've been dragging my parents out to every single touch tank aquarium that I could find ever since I was four years old um, and really getting connected with, with Earth Echo to have that grander scale international aspect of water science and citizen science has been a real blessing over the past two years that I've been involved with them. Would be that going to their youth leadership summits or attending webinars and getting to talk to real leaders who are able to have that really global impact on initiatives such as Ocean uh, 30 by 30, which is aiming to protect 30% of our oceans by 2030. And in Benjamin Franklin's own words, when the well is dry, we know the worth of water. Our well, our ocean, our global ocean, is really what inspires me to find that worth and to participate in citizen science through Earth Echo. I am learning about the science not only via testing kits in my local rivers um, during my summer crew programs or uh, river cleanups via my environmental clubs, uh, but now I'm getting to participate in grander scale uh, advocacy work for with and via Earth Echo. Uh, a lot of the energy that I feel with Earth Echo is based in curiosity. A lot of which drives citizen science in general. And really what better untapped resource for curiosity than youth, than kids. I remember when I was four years old, my mom had to set a limit that there were no more questions after 7 p.m. Now I have broken that time and time again, but such is that curiosity that drives our citizen science. And what's really inspiring is getting to work with the other Water Challenge ambassadors, all who are members of Generation Z, my generation, who are now using that curiosity and participating in citizen science via Earth Echo and then amplifying it, amplifying it through digital media and through our own documentaries and our posts and everything like that in order to share our story, share our work and to learn more about what is going on in the world around us and applying that to advocacy work and uh, what we hope to see in the future. And I think a lot of that is really going beyond what Ben Franklin could have ever imagined in creating that sort of instantaneous network of sharing citizen science and of sharing uh, our initiatives. And what I would really like to emphasize before I turn it over back to Korsha is that for anybody looking to get into any aspect of citizen science, um, be it any age, it's really important to not be uh, intimidated by the field. You can start in your science classes. You can start, you know, it's not cliche to do the baking soda volcano or to simply do a beach cleanup. It's really important to start small and you don't need to be super accomplished to make an impact. A lot of what Earth Echo has really helped me to learn is to grab the resources and ask the right questions and contact the right people in order to make a really meaningful impact. It's a lot bigger than your high school biology class, but it's super important to take those next steps after you have started small. And that's what's really helpful to 
uh, engage in via Earth Echo is they will provide you with the right resources and the right questions uh, to take that next step in formu formulating and facilitating these uh, community events. Part of my work has involved uh, group projects via my own high school environmental club and via local uh, river organizations in my community based in Boston. We love our dirty Charles River water, but a lot of that has um, come with questions and with initiatives to learn more about that. And what's really great about the uh, Water Challenge Ambassador Program is that now we have a platform to gather data, to share data um, on a grander scale. And Portia, uh, you're welcome to turn it over to the Flogger campaign because I know that's one of the, our greatest um, community events. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Caroline, for expressing your experience as a Water Challenge ambassador. And the beauty of our program is to have these young people become citizen scientists and lead ongoing water monitoring efforts um, throughout the Water Challenge program, um, which is a global water monitoring program that has engaged 1.6 million participants in over 146 countries. So again, I wanna thank you, Caroline, for all of your hard work for networking with youth across the globe and also sharing your passion to uh, protect our waterways. Opportunities to get involved. We are currently launching the Earth Echo Water Heroes Plogger campaign in collaboration with our partners, Xylem and Manchester City football team. It started on March 22nd and it ends this Friday on Earth Day where we're encouraging you all to go out today to plog. If you've never heard of plogging, it's simply jogging and walking or running while also picking up litter uh, around your waterways. You can participate by, again, going out and plogging and creating an account on SciStarter to report your findings. So in the chat, we will make sure that you have all that information. And to conclude, I just want to thank you all for all of your efforts and encourage you all to continue to make a difference to protect our ocean planet. So I'm gonna pass it back to Caroline to wrap up and then we will pass it along to Heather. Thank you so much, Portia. And I've been, I've seen a question in the chat from Chloe, has my involvement with citizen science uh, and the Earth Echo Water Challenge impacted what I would like to study in college? Yes, it really has. It's been an example to uh, network with a lot of people who are helping me and advising me to go after different programs and internships. I wanted to be a marine biologist in second grade, but through Earth Echo, I've learned that there is so much more to ocean advocacy than just learning about the biology of it. And to that end, I really want to pursue a career in public policy related to marine advocacy. So I think it really has been a great portal to learn more about what we can add onto our advocacy work. Awesome. And to learn more about the Earth Echo Water Challenge, we encourage you to follow us on social media at Earth Echo International on YouTube. And lastly, you're welcome to go to monitorwater.org to learn more about our program, how to get water quality test kits, and how to become citizen scientists in your community. Um, again, I want to thank you all, and I want to now pass it to Heather to wrap up today's session. Thank you, Portia. It's so great that you've been able to involve young people through the Earth Echo Water Challenge Ambassador Program. I love hearing about your citizen science in action and the difference you make every day through your work. Just a reminder that everyone can get involved. Go to SciStarter.org to learn about citizen science projects in your community. And to learn more about Benjamin Franklin, stream Ken Burns' documentary at pbs.org. It's been a great pleasure to celebrate Citizen Science Month with all of you, so get out there and get involved. I'm Heather Marie Montia, and until next time, happy reading. <laughs>